Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. It can be found on page 1034 of your Pew Bibles. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. Hear these words. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued high, highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and to heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes. I tell this one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant healed. The word of God for the people of God. All right. Thank you very much, Pastor Mark. I have a message for you today entitled, Unworthy? Question mark. I want to thank you all for your thoughts and prayers this last week. We were on the road uh, mid part of the week and preached in Virginia, Northeast Virginia. And uh, the pastor there said it was the largest type, largest event of that type that they'd ever had, which is remarkable. And it was the first time they had broadcast their services. And uh, they're right at 500 views, close to 500 views for that, for that Facebook Live event. First time they'd ever done something like that. So obviously your prayers... Um, Prayers of family and friends made all the difference in the world, so we appreciate that as we extend our ministry to other places. So we're in, the, in this process of Lent. We had Ash Wednesday, and now we are on the way, as we talked about last week, the 40 days between Ash Wednesday and Easter, and not, not uh, counting the Sundays in between. Those are many, M-I-N-I, miniature Easter's. So without counting Sundays between Ash Wednesday and Easter, 40 days, we're in this process of Lent. And let's talk about this idea of unworthiness. So join me as we pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for our being with us today. We feel your presence, and we know that you are among us. And we reach out to you, just as you are reaching out to us. Connecting, touching, communicating, and blessing. And so, Lord, our minds are alert, our hearts are open, our spirits are ready. May the words from the ancient scripture that we read moments ago leap from the pages of history directly into our hearts and minds, where we might apply these words where we are really living right here in 21st century America, or wherever we are watching or listening from. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This concept of not being worthy seems to be pervasive in society, doesn't it? Um, when you think about it, there are certain criteria that we use to judge people. Do you have a certain education level to get this job? Do you have a certain skill level to play that sport? Do you have a certain um, measurement that you have somehow checked the box on so that you've gotten to the place where you might be accepted for one group or another? This idea of measuring up and worthiness seems to be pervasive across society, even as something as simple as have you passed the test to be able to go on to the next grade, things of that nature. Have you, have you measured up? Are you worthy enough to do whatever it is you feel like you want to do. We see it all the time in sports teams and the draft and all those things where people are like, well, I want to be on that team. I, want to, I hope that team drafts me. I hope I, get, uh, I hope I get on that team. Or even here at Upward, when people are choosing teams and this and that, who goes on what team, that type of thing. Are we measuring up? Do we make the grade? Have we reached the level that we hope to reach? And so maybe that's why it seems to spill over into our spiritual life into our faith life? Have we measured up? Have we made the grade? Have we made it to where we feel like we need to be? 
One of our viewers writes, I read the letter this week. You don't know everything I've done. Can I still be loved and accepted by God? It's a question that seems to be pervasive. Uh, no matter what grade, what background, what age, what background or, or, or area of life that we find ourselves in, what part of the country we live in. Can I still be loved by God? Can I still be accepted? I've thought a lot about that over these last several days as I've prepared this message, and I wonder where this idea takes root. Where does it come from, really? And I think it must go back all the way to the origin of, of the Europeans who came to this country hundreds of years ago. And they were known as Puritans. Now, when they got here, it was obvious they were not the first ones here. There were, uh, there were cultures here hundreds of years before them. And, and yet they come to this land seeking religious freedom. We know that because we read their writings. And we know that they said, we are leaving this part of Europe and we are moving to a new land where we might be, and, and we quote these words from their writings, a new Jerusalem. They wanted to, be, they wanted to build a new society based on religious freedom. And yet, what do they do when they get here? They put into place the exact same thing that they left. They left a draconian, rule-based, you better measure up society, and yet they came here for religious freedom, and the first thing they do is to put these rules into place that you better do this, you better do that, you better do the other thing, or you don't measure up, or you're not holy enough, or you're not spiritual enough. And there's this idea of judgmentalism that, well, you're not holy and you're not good and you're not righteous, etc. And so they would kick them out of these, these societies. And, and you know the history of, uh, of America and, and, and a lot of the craziness that went on because of this whole concept of you are not holy enough, you're not Christian enough, when these people just came from that same crazy society. I just wish we could, we could go on a time machine or like Peabody and Sherman on a Wayback Machine and go back and talk to these people and say, what is wrong with you folks? Do you realize you just came from a situation that you wanted to flee and yet you're doing the exact same thing to your people that they were doing to you? It's craziness. Well, I guess it shouldn't surprise us. It's just a few miles down the road. We find similar societies. We know them as the Amish. And you could be their daughter. You could be their son. You don't do exactly what you want them to do. They shun you which means they won't talk to you. It means you're out of the group. I mean, these people might make good jelly and, and nice quilts, but that is screwed up theology. Let's just be honest with each other. It's crazy. It's the exact opposite of what Jesus taught. It's the exact opposite of what Jesus is trying to communicate. It's not that you don't measure up and you're not good enough and therefore you're, I'm not going to talk to you or therefore you're kicked out of my group. No, no, no. It's that because of Jesus' presence, we are made holy, we are made righteous. The Bible says he imputed, which means gave, his righteousness to us. So it doesn't matter how holy you are or how holy I am. That doesn't even, that doesn't even enter into the realm of possibility when it comes to whether you are part of the faith or not. It's whether you are willing to say, yes, Jesus, come into my life and live within me, and you become a believer. He then gives us his gift of righteousness. He didn't come, you know, Jesus just didn't look at his calendar and say, well, I've got nothing going on right now. I'm just going to hop down to the to down there and die on a cross just for the heck of it because I have nothing else to do today. He came here on purpose to live, to die and to rise again, that we might all have that resurrection power to rise as well, to be the people he created us to be. But he didn't do that so we could then beat ourselves up that we're not righteous and we're not holy enough. He did it so we might be given his righteousness. So let's look at the Bible story today. There is a centurion who has a servant who is ill. And so he calls upon Jesus to come and to help. And uh, the word reaches Jesus, the Bible tells us, and he is talking to some folks when the word comes to him. And he says, okay, let's go. So they're on their way to this centurion's house. Now, the interesting thing about a centurion is that he was in charge of a century. Today, we might call it a, a unit or, or a battalion or a troop. Back then, the, the military term was a century. We think of century as a period of time, don't we? But back then, a century was a unit of men, 100 people. 
And, and a centurion was in charge of the century. So he was a high-ranking military official who had 100 people at his disposal. And one of his servants becomes sick, and so he believes that Jesus can help. But before Jesus gets to his property, he sends out a word and says, Jesus, I am unworthy for you to come into my home. But I believe if you just say the word, my servant will be healed. Just say the word from where you are, and that'll be good enough. And Jesus thinks about that for a moment, and he proclaims, I have never seen this kind of faith, even in all of Jerusalem. Which is really interesting, because this centurion is a Gentile. He is a military leader. No seeming connectedness to the faith. And yet, he has the belief that if Jesus just says the word, no matter how many miles away, that this servant, this friend, will be healed. He obviously has compassion for this friend. He wants this friend to be better. And he says, Jesus, if you will just say the word. And uh, I suppose Jesus didn't hear that every day. Although he deserved to hear it every day, he didn't. And so it shocked him to the point that he says, wow, not even in all of Israel have I ever heard such great faith. The faith was not about the man's unworthiness, The faith was about he believed Jesus could do whatever he set his mind to doing. And that his faith, Jesus' faith, could travel through the miles to touch the person that this man cared about. So then we have to look within ourselves. And we know within ourselves, sometimes we feel like we don't measure up. Sometimes we feel like, you know, we don't have any business dealing with an almighty, all-holy God. How can we even be in the ballpark of dealing with him? We, we just don't measure up. We know that feeling because we felt it in other areas of life where we just feel like we just didn't quite make it. We wanted to, we did our best, we just didn't quite make it. And so we feel that way sometimes about our faith and about our ability to belong, really. And that's why you'll hear somebody say, hey, would you come to church with me? And they'll say, well, if I walked into your church, the ceiling would fall in on me. Or the walls would cave in, or some silly thing like that. Now we understand that, you know, that's a silly little joke. That's a funny quip that you might say. But the fact of the matter is, that's the exact opposite of what Jesus wants to communicate to any individual. It's not about them walking in to a church and the the walls falling in on them or the ceiling collapsing because it has absolutely nothing to do with them. If If it had to do with you and me and them, then none of us would ever go to church any time. None of us would ever even speak the word God. None of us would even dare to speak the word, the name Jesus, because we would not feel holy enough. We wouldn't feel righteous enough. How can we come into your presence, God, an all-holy God, when we are obviously sinners? So it gets back to the individual who wrote me that letter. Can some, knowing everything I've done, can God still love me? Can I still belong? And of course, the answer resounds throughout the centuries. Absolutely Yes, because it's not about you and it's not about me. If we don't have to meet some kind of a litmus test that if we can finally get there, we're perfect. We want to be perfect. And yet that is so elusive. And counselor's offices and mental wards are full of people who cannot deal with the fact that they're not perfect. When the fact of the matter is, we aren't called to be perfect. Even our founder, John Wesley, who started the Methodist movement, which became the Methodist church, said... We are moving on to perfection. That means it's always just one step ahead of us, but we're trying our best. We're doing our best, but it's just one step beyond. Yet we try to move on toward perfection. We try our best, but we realize we can't, and so we believe that Jesus comes and takes us from where we are to where he wants us to be through a supernatural process of imputing or giving us his righteousness. If it were just about you and me being righteous and therefore we got to meet this certain test and we've got to be, you know, holy so we don't get shunned and so we don't get kicked out of the group and so we don't get ignored and until we can be good enough. Then it's got to be something beyond that. And it's what Jesus came to do. And that is to save, to refresh, to renew and to give us a new chance to try again. When I think about this idea of the the Puritans and the history, uh, some history of of our our nation, it occurs to me that if we find ourselves like a hamster on that wheel, never measuring up and never being worthy enough, then it gives us permission 
to just chuck it all and say, you know what, I, I, I might, as well not, might as well not even try because I'm never going to be able to make it, so why should I even try? I'm just going to give up and do whatever the heck I want to do and live whatever kind of life I want to live and just roll the dice, whatever happens to me at the end, happens to me at the end. Who cares? Because if you try and you try and you try and you never really feel like you're going to make it, then you stop trying and you give up. And as people of faith, if we allow ourselves to get into that wheel, then not only do we not measure up, other people don't measure up. And we find ourselves all the time in this controversy and pressure and problems. And when all we need to realize is, you know what, Lord? Let's just be honest. We are, we've made some mistakes. We've, we've committed some sins on purpose, some things we've omitted that we knew we should have done, all these kind of things that we've messed up. But you know what, Lord? It's not about us anymore. It never was about us. It's about you and about your holiness and your righteousness calling us forward to say, I believe in you as you are. And you are welcome to be a part of my family. That's why Jesus often said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's why Jesus would pick people up and brush them off and get them going again. You will never find not only not one single time in the Bible, and you can go through it with a fine tooth comb. You will not find one time Jesus kicking the dirt in someone's face and saying, ha ha, you're a sinner. Get out of... Go to hell. Not one time. Why? Because Jesus' reason for coming here was to rescue people from, from it and to bring them from the depths of despair and discouragement and disillusionment and say, you are good enough because I'm good enough. And together, we can make it. That's the beautiful thing about being a believer in Jesus, that we don't have to worry about judging other people. Instead, we don't have to try to measure up or cause other people to measure up. We can just say, Jesus loves you as you are. And because of that warmth and that love, we are beckoned to be better people. It just naturally happens. When someone believes in you and you know they believe in you no matter what, it's going to make us want to be better people. It's going to make us want to be all that God created us to be because he already believes in us not because we have to measure up to some unknown test that we could never reach anyway. So on the cover of your bulletin, you see the word unworthy, and you see an eraser erasing the U and the N of un, and just leaving the word worthy. You're worthy, and I'm worthy because Jesus is worthy, and Jesus made you worthy. Because Jesus surrounds you with his love and his goodness and says, you can be everything I created you to be. So arise and take your place as a believer, as a person of faith. Not caught in some kind of a web of craziness. You know the story of George Washington. Tomorrow, America is going to celebrate President's Day. Last Monday was President Lincoln's birthday. Tomorrow is President Washington's birthday. And somehow they, they try to put the... Often the, the holiday is in between the two somehow. But in any case, tomorrow we're celebrating President's Day. You know, back years ago... A, a minister of another denomination told a story. He just made it up. He said, you know, one day George Washington was growing up and he chopped down a cherry tree. And uh, he didn't want to tell anybody, but finally his father found out. And his father said, George, did you chop down this cherry tree? And he said, well, yes, I did. I cannot tell a lie. And, um, you know, I'm sorry, etc." So they used this as a morality play throughout history to t teach people about not lying, I guess, but the the strange thing about that, friends, is if you were to go back and visit all the various places across, around Virginia that, that General Washington lived and grew up with his family, you will find not one cherry tree existed on their property. He never saw a cherry tree. He never chopped down a cherry tree. There was never a cherry tree for him to chop down. He never, that story never existed. So here's the deal. Some preacher somewhere decided to make up a lie to try to teach people about not lying. Is that the silly, silliest thing? It's crazy. I don't know why. why it just, let's make something up and pretend like it's true. Now, you and I know George Washington was a politician. Of course the man lied. Let's just be honest. He was a great man. I've got a lot of friends who are politicians. They lie, okay? People, politicians lie. I don't know why they do. They just do. They're just, you know, it's the, it's the expediency of the moment. Tell people what they want to hear at any moment and, you know, whatever. I'm sure the man lied. He was a great man. He was a great general. He was a terrific president, I'm sure. 
But let's just be honest. I'm sure somewhere along the line, he lied. So if we're trying to measure ourselves up with don't chop down a cherry tree, the cherry tree never existed. That story never happened. So you and I come face to face with reality. What about you and me? How about our lives? Where can we rise up and do better? By simply saying, Lord Jesus, you know what? You know me. I'm sorry for I've missed it. But it's not about me anyway. It's about you, Lord. And I accept your righteousness. When you tend to get down on yourself or down on others, just take a step back and say, you know what? It's not about me. It's not about them, Lord. It's about you. And we receive your worthiness and your righteousness. And we thank you for loving us and accepting us just as we are. You are worthy because Jesus is worthy. Let's pray. Dear Lord, across this sanctuary and all of our friends who are tuning in or are listening online or, or via radio, you're reminding us, Lord, that it's not about us. It's not about whether you're good enough or I'm good enough or something else is good enough. It's all about you, Lord Jesus, and about your goodness and your righteousness and your holiness and the fact that you chose to step out of eternity into this planet and inject your graciousness and your love and your forgiveness and your holiness to make us more than we currently are, to, to help rise us to a place, to lift us to a place of holiness and righteousness because of you. So forgive us, Lord, of our mistakes, of those things we've left undone, of those things that we have done that were mistakes of, of times that we've missed it. Forgive us and cleanse us from that unrighteousness now, Lord. Give us a fresh new beginning during this season of Lent to truly understand and grasp the gift that you've given us. It's not about being puritanical, about being draconian and about rules, about somehow measuring up with some litmus test. Instead, it's simply saying, Lord Jesus, come in and live within me. Make me your own. And so that brings us to this, Lord. There may be people sitting in this sanctuary or listening to the sound of my voice somewhere else who have never accepted you. And so we take this moment and say, Lord Jesus, I want to believe. Come in and live within me. I want to be a Christian. We prayed that simple three-sentence prayer or anything similar to it. All of a sudden now you have taken up residence in our lives and you've given us a fresh opportunity, Lord, to be your people, to be a believer. And we thank you for that. Perhaps there are others who have prayed that prayer, and yet today we feel moved to rededicate ourselves to you, to say, Lord Jesus, we yet again sign on the dotted line to be your people, to be people of light, people of hope, people of faith. Lord, we thank you for all of these good gifts that you give us, and most of all, for your example, for which we are so very grateful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.